Welcome back. In the last unit, we talked about metadata in general, the functions of metadata, what it means to describe something. And now in this unit, I want to get more specific and talk about one specific metadata schema, the Dublin Core. Now, the Dublin Core may not be the simplest metadata schema out there, but it has got to be close. And I don't say that as an insult. The Dublin Core was deliberately designed to be very simple, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And many other metadata schemas are built on top of Dublin Core. So before we move on to everything else in this course, we really have to start with Dublin Core. Dublin Core is not named after Dublin, Ireland. It is named after Dublin, Ohio, which is a city just outside of Columbus. No insult intended to anyone who lives in Ohio, but that's, you know, I've always felt slightly less exciting. The reason Dublin Core is named after Dublin, Ohio is that Dublin, Ohio is the headquarters of OCLC, which stands for the Online Computer Library Center which is a nonprofit organization. It's a big player in the library sector, and they develop and license tools for information organizations of all kinds. And even if you've never heard of OCLC, which unless you're in the library sector, maybe you haven't, um, you've probably used some of their products. Uh, First Search and WorldCat are two of their larger databases that you're likely to have used. They also own the trademark and copyrights on the Dewey Decimal System. And uh, it's possible that you've never thought about the fact that somebody owns Dewey Decimal, uh, but OCLC owns it. So if you've ever used the Dewey Decimal System in a library, you're using an OCLC product. Um, but since this isn't a course on library service providers, we'll leave that alone for now. So. Dublin Core is called that because its origin is from a workshop hosted by OCLC in Dublin, Ohio, in March of 1995. And at that workshop, OCLC brought together a bunch of researchers and professionals in a wide range of information-related uh, fields in information science, in librarianship, in computer science, in museums and archives and geospatial data, um, and a variety of others to discuss technology for how to describe and organize and provide access to information over networks. Now, a little bit of web history for you. The first ever web browser was Mosaic. Some of you may remember Mosaic. It was released in 1993. So in March of 95, when OCLC hosted this workshop, the web as we know it was really quite new, less than two years old. So the problems of how to describe and organize and provide access to networked information, particularly at web scale, even though the web in 95 was quite a bit smaller than it is now, still, talking about all of these issues around providing access and to networked information at web scale was almost completely unexplored territory at that time. So that's why Dublin. And uh, now let's talk about why core. Uh, the short version is that one of the purposes of this workshop in 95 was to come up with a core set of metadata elements to describe networked resources, anything that might exist on the internet or the then developing early web. In other words, what is the minimum set of descriptors that you need to describe literally anything that might exist online? So these are two of my favorite quotes about standards 
you know, ever. Um, and here's the problem. Uh, there are a zillion standards out there. Even within professions or fields, there are often many, sometimes dozens of different standards, forget about in the world as a whole, right? When you have different standards, it becomes difficult to share the things that are being described by those standards. And the Dublin Core is a deliberate attempt to, if not completely solve, then at a very minimum, chip away at that problem. So at this 1995 workshop in Dublin, Ohio, all these folks from all of these diverse technology-related fields got together and recognized the need to standardize description of web content, right? To help users find things, to help search tools work better, to promote the development of new technologies that they probably couldn't even imagine in 1995, right? It was thought that the way to do that, or one way to do that was to create a common set of metadata elements that could be used to describe things on the web. In other words, there was a need for a metadata core to the web. And the rest is history. So there's a graph that I've seen in a variety of forms that looks more or less like this and along one axis you get functionality in other words what your technology can do and along the other axis you get cost and obviously that's going to be financial cost but it also includes things like time human resources you know attention etc so the point of this graph is that the higher the cost the fewer adopters of a new technology you're going to have. So if something has high cost, even if it has high functionality, you're going to have few adopters. And if you've got low cost, you'll have you know, many adopters. If you've got low functionality but high cost, obviously you're going to get very few adopters. And if you've got low cost and high functionality, well that's ideal, you're going to have very many ad adopters of a new technology. And you can fill in particular tools and technologies, you know, on this graph to your heart's content. You know, a couple of obvious ones are HTML versus SGML. HTML has not, you know, very low functionality, but it doesn't do a lot of things, but it's a fairly low cost of adoption because it's really easy to learn HTML, where SGML does a lot more than HTML, but it's very difficult or more difficult to learn than HTML. So it has fewer users. Another example that you might think about is something like, you know, Google Maps, which is has a very nice interface. Um, so it's got a low cost of adoption, fairly easy to learn how to use, but it doesn't do nearly as much as, you know, professional grade geographic information systems like, for example, you know, ArcGIS, which has a much higher learning curve, but it does a lot more. And you can fill in, you know, your favorite technologies on this, on this graph. So the point here is that the more complex a technology, the higher the cost of adopting it in terms of time and resources required. So the fewer users it's going to have. This is consistent with the theory of diffusion of innovations, which was first proposed way back in 1962 by a researcher by the name of Everett Rogers. Now the diffusion of innovations develops a model of why and how fast new innovations, that is technology or ideas, are adopted into society as a whole. Now, 
society means different things and researchers have studied the diffusion of innovations in societies from the most remote societies in the world to modern American and European culture. So, for example, think about how fast the car was adopted, right? Here you have auto and you have this very gradual adoption curve versus the cell phone which was adopted very quickly. Now that top of the curve here is the point of saturation. In other words, when everyone in society who's going to own that thing owns one, right? Everyone in modern American culture who's going to own a car owns a car. And there are always going to be holdouts, right? The classic example in the United States of this is the Amish, right? The Amish are not going to own a car, no matter what you do. But everybody else who's going to own a car has one. So the car has reached the saturation point of adoption, right? The cell phone, for example, was adopted much more quickly and you can talk about why one adoption it one innovation excuse me was adopted more or less quickly than others this particular graphic is from the new york times from an article a few years back and it shows this really classic s curve because most of these more or less have this s shape to them and that's a classic feature of the adoption of innovations um, and the diffusion of innovations talks about different types of users at different points along this curve the point is that s curve is a classic shape for adoption of new technology and new ideas now Everett Rogers and researchers who came after him um, outline five factors of the adoption of any kind of a new thing, right? Why or why not something is adopted? I'm not going to get into all five of these factors, but the important one here, I think fairly obviously, is complexity or simplicity, right? If a potential user thinks that an innovation is too complex, that raises the cost, the perceived cost anyway, of adopting that innovation, so that user won't adopt that innovation. On the flip side, if something is seen as simple to use, that lowers the cost, the perceived cost, or the actual cost of adoption, and so that it that user will adopt that innovation that new technology, right? And that's the niche that the Dublin Core fills, deliberately was designed to fill that low bar of adoption, right? The Dublin Core was designed to be very simple, very easy to use, to have a very low cost of adoption. The Dublin Core was, to put it bluntly, designed to be so bone simple that no one would have any excuse for not adopting it. 